Your reader is Margie Colas, and we're going to start off tonight with a story called A Dry, Quiet War by Tony Daniel. I cannot tell you what it meant to me to see the two sons of Pharaoh set behind the dry mountain east of my home. I've been away 12 billion years. I passed my cabin to the pump well, taking a metal cup from where it hung from a set pin. I worked the handle three times. At first it creaked. I believed it was rusted tight. Then it loosened, and within 15 pulls, I had a cup of water. Someone had kept the pump up. Someone had seen to the house and the land while I was away at the war. For me, it had been 15 years. I wasn't sure how long it had been up for Pharaoh. The water was tinged red and tasted of iron. Good. I drank it all in a long draft, then put the cup back onto its hanger. When the big sun Hemingway set, a slight breeze kicked up. Then Fitzgerald went down. Cold, cloudless night spanked down onto the plateau. I shivered a little, adjusted my internals, and stood motionless, waiting for the last of twilight to pass and the stars, my stars, to come out. Steiner, the planet that is Pharaoh's evening star, was the first to emerge, low in the west, methane blue. Then the constellations. Gaul, Gilgamesh, the big snake, half-coiled over the southwestern horizon. There was no moon tonight. There was never a moon on Pharaoh, and that was right. After a time, I walked to the house, climbed up the porch, and the house recognized me and turned on the lights. I went inside. The place was dusty, the furniture covered with sheets. There were no signs of rats or gingers. All seemed in repair. I sighed, blinked, and tried to feel something. Too early, probably. I started to take a covering from a chair, then let it be. I went to the kitchen and checked the cupboard. An old malt whiskey bottle, some dry cereal, some spices. The spices had been my mother's. I seldom used them before I left for the end of time. I considered that the whiskey might be perfectly aged by now. But as the saying goes on Pharaoh, we like a bit of food with our drink. So I left the house and took the road to town, to Heidel. It was a five-mile walk. Though I could have enhanced and covered the ground in ten minutes or so, I walked at a regular pace under my home world stars. The road was dirt, of course. My pat legs were dusted red when I stopped under the outside light of Thread Martin's pub. I took a last breath of cold air and went inside to the warm. It was a good night at Thread Martin's. There were men and women gathered around the fire hearth, uses and splices in the cold corners. The regulars were at the bar, a couple of whom I recognized. So old now, wise and like stored apples in a barrel. I looked around for a particular face, but she was not there. Jukebox sputtered some core cloud deek. The air was thick with smoke and conversation. It was until I walked in. Nobody turned to face me. Most of them couldn't have seen me, but a signal passed. Conversation fell to a quiet murmur. Somebody quickly killed the jukebox. I blimped up an internals menu into my peripheral vision and adjusted to the room's temperature. Then I went to the edge of the bar. The room got even quieter. The bartender, old Thread Martin himself, reluctantly came over to me. What can I do for you, sir? He asked me. I looked over him to the selection of bottles, tubes, and cans on display behind him. I don't see it, I said. Eh? He glanced back over his shoulder, then quickly returned to peering at me. Bones barley, I said. We don't have any more of that, Thread Martin said with a suspicious tone. Why not? The man who made it died. How long ago? Twenty years, more or less. I don't see what business of... What about his son? Thread Martin backed up a step, then another. Henry, he whispered. Henry Bone? Just give me the best that you do have, Peter Thread Martin, I said. In fact, I'd like to buy everybody around on me. Henry Bone? Why, you looked to me like a bad one indeed when you walked in here. I took you for one of them glims I did, Thread Martin said. I did not know what he was talking about. And he smiled an old devil's crooked smile. Your money's no good here, Henry Bone. I do happen to have a couple of bottles of your old dad's whiskey stowed away in back. Drinks are on the house. And so I returned to my world. For most of those I'd left behind, it seemed as if I'd never really gone. My neighbors hadn't changed much in the 20 years local that had passed. Of course, they had no conception of what had happened to me. They only knew that I'd been to the war. The big war at the end of time. And evidently, everything turned out okay, for here I was, back on my own time in my own place. I planted Pharaoh's desert barley, brought in peat for the mountain bogs, bred the biomass that would extract the minerals from my hard groundwater, got ready for making whiskey once again. 
Most of the inhabitants of Faro were divided between whiskey families and beer families. Bones were distillers, never brewers, since the settlement ten generations before. It wasn't until she called upon me that I heard the first hint of the troubles that had come. Her name was Alinda Bexter. Since we played together under the floor planks of her father's hotel, I always called her Bex. When I left for the war, she was 20, I was 21. I still recognized her at 40, five years older than I was now. She came walking down the road to my house a week after I'd returned. She was taller than most women on Pharaoh. She might be mistaken for a use of human splice anywhere else. She was rangy. She wore a khaki dress that whipped in the dry wind as she came toward me. I stood on the porch waiting for her, wondering what she would say. Well, this is a load off me, she said. She was wearing a brimmed hat, had a ribbon in under the chin, but Bex had not used it. She held her hat on to keep it from blowing off her head. This damn ranch has been one big thankless task. So it was you who kept it up, I said. Just kept it from falling apart as fast as it would have otherwise, she replied. We stood and looked at one another for a moment. Her eyes were green. Now that I had seen an ocean, I could understand the kind of green they were. Well then, I finally said, come on in. I offered, offered her some sweet cake I'd fried up and some beer that my neighbor Shin had brought by, both of which she declined. We sat in the living room on furniture covered with white sheets I had yet to remove. Bex and I took it slow, getting to know each other again. She ran her father's place now. For years, the only way to get to Heidel was by freighter. We'd finally gotten a note on the flash, even though Farrow was still a backwater planet. There were more strangers passing through than there ever had been, usually en route to other places. Sometimes stayed a night or two in the Bexter Hotel. Its reputation was spreading, Bex claimed. I believed her. Even when she was young, she'd been shrewd but honest, a combination you don't often find in an innkeeper. She was a quiet woman. That is, until she got to know you well. And some most likely thought her conceited. I got the feeling that she hadn't let down her reserve for a long time. When I knew her before, Bex did not have many close friends. But for the ones she had, such as me, she poured out her thoughts and her heart. I found that she hadn't changed much in that way. Did you marry? I asked her after hearing about the hotel and her father's bad health. No, she said. No, I very nearly did, but then I did not. Did you? No. Who was it? Raw Kenton. Raw Kenton? Raw Kenton, whose parents were on the hops market? He was a quarter splice, a tall man on a world of tall men. Yet when I knew him, his long shadow had been deceptive. There, no, there was no spark or force in him. I can't see that, Bex. Tom Kenton died ten years ago, she said. Marjorie retired. Rawl owned the business until just last year. Rawl did all right. You'd be surprised. Something about his father's passing gave him a backbone. Too much of one, maybe. What happened? He died, she said. He died, too, just as I thought you had. Now she told me she would like a beer after all, and I went to get her a bottle of Shin's Ale. When I returned, I could tell that she'd been crying a little. The Glims killed Rawl, said Bex before I could ask her about him. That's their name for themselves, anyway. Humans, Repons, Calawacs, I don't know what else. It passed through last year and stayed for a week in Heidel. Very bad. They made my father give over the whole hotel to them. Then they had a, a trial, they called it. Every house was called and made to pay a tithe. The Glims decided how much. Rawl refused to pay. He brought along a pistol. Lord knows where he got it tried to shoot one of them. They just laughed and took it from him. Now the tears started again. And then they hauled him out into the street in front of the hotel. Bex took a moment and got control of herself. They burnt him up with a pea gun, burnt his legs off first, then his arms, then the rest of him, after they let him lie there a while. There wasn't a trace of him after that. We couldn't even bury him. I couldn't take her to me, hold her, not after she told me about Rawl. Needing something to do, I took some tangled banwood from the tinderbox and struggled to get a fire going from the burnt-down coals in my hearth. I blew into the fireplace and only got a nose full of ashes for my trouble. Didn't anybody fight? I asked. Not after that. We just waited them out. Or they got bored. I don't know. It was bad for everybody, not just Rawl. Beck shook her head, sighed, then saw the trouble I was having and bent down to help me. She was much better at it than I, and the fire was soon ablaze. We sat back down and watched it flicker. 
Sounds like war ghosts, I said. The glims? Soldiers who don't go home after the war. The fighting gets into them, and they don't want to give it up, or can't. Sometimes they have modifications that won't let them give it up. They wonder the time ways, since they don't belong to, to the time they show up in their hard to kill. In the early times when people didn't know about the war, or had only heard rumors of it, they had lots of names. Vampires, hega monsters, zombies. What can you do? I put my arm around her. It had been so long. She tensed up, then breathed deeply, serenely. Hope they don't come back, I said. They are bad ones. Not the worst, but bad. We were quiet for a while, and the wind blowing over the chimney's top made the flue moan as if it were a big stone flute. Did you love him, Bex? I asked. Raw? She didn't even hesitate in her answer this time. Of course not, Henry Bone. How could you even think such a thing? I was waiting to catch up with you. Now tell me about the future. So I drew away from her for a while and told her, part of it at least, about how there's not enough dark matter to pull the cosmos back together again, not enough mass to undulate in an eternal cycle. Instead, there is an end. All the stars are either dead or dying. All that there is is nothing but dim night. I told her about the twilight armies gathered there, called from all times, all places. Creatures, presences, machines, weapons fighting galaxy to galaxy, system to system, fighting until the critical point is reached when entropy flows no more, but pools, pools in endless stagnant pools of nothing, no light, no heat, no effect, and the universe is dead, and so those who remained inherit the dark fields. They win. And did you win? she asked me, if that's the word for it. The suns were going down. Instead of answering, I went outside of the woodpile and brought in enough bandwood to fuel the fire for the night. I thought maybe she would forget what she'd asked me, but not Bex. How does the war end, Henry? You must never ask me that. I spoke the words carefully, making sure I was giving away nothing in my reply. Every time a returning soldier tells that answer, he changes everything. And he has two choices. He can either go away, leave his own time, and go back to fight again. Or he can stay. It will all mean nothing, what he did. Not just who won and who lost. All the things he did in the war spin off into nothing. Dex thought about this for a while. What could it matter? What in God's name could be worth fighting for, she finally asked. Time ends. Nothing matters after that. What could it possibly, ma what could it possibly matter who won, who wins? It means you can go back home, I said, after it's over. I don't understand. I shook my head and was silent. I had said enough. There's no way to tell her more in any case, not without changing things, and no way to say what it was that had brought these forces together at the end of everything. What the hell do I know, even now? All I know is what I was told, what I was trained to do. If we don't fight at the end, there won't be a beginning. For there to be people, there has to be a war to fight at the end of things. We live in that kind of universe and not another, they told me. They told me, and then I told myself. I did what I had to do so that it would be over and I could go home, come back. Bex, I never forgot you, I said. She came to sit with me by the fire. We didn't touch at first, but I felt her next to me, breathing the flush of her skin as the fire warmed her. Then she ran her hand along my arm, felt the bumps from the operational enhancements. What have they done to you? She whispered. Unbidden, the old words of the Skyfaller's scream, the words that were yet to be, surfaced in my mind. They sucked down my heart to a little black hole. You cannot stab me. They wrote down my brain on a hard knot of space. You cannot turn me. Icicle spike from the eye of a star. I've come to kill you. I almost spoke them from sheer habit. I did not. The war was over. Bex was here, and I knew it was over. I was going to feel something once again. Something besides guile, hate, and rage. I didn't yet, that was true. I could feel the possibility. I don't really breathe anymore, Bex. I pretend to so I won't put people off, I told her. It's been so long I can't even remember what it was like to have to. Bex kissed me then. First I didn't remember how to do that either. And then I did. I added wood to the fire, then ran my hand along Bex's neck and shoulder. Her skin had the health of youth still. The years in the sun and wind had made a supple leather of it, tanned and grained fine. We took the sheet from the couch and pulled it near to the warmth, 
and she drew me down to her on it, to her neck and breasts. Did they leave enough of me? Uh, did they leave enough of you for me? She whispered. I had not known until now. Yes, I answered. There's enough. I found my way inside her, and we made love slowly, in a manner that might seem sad to any others but us, for there were memories and years of longing that flowed from us, around us, like amber just at the melting point. We were inside, and there was nothing for the present with nothing for this present with all of what was and what would be already passed. No time. Finally, only Bex and no time between us. We fell asleep on the old couch. It was dim half morning when we awoke, the Fitzgerald yet to rise in the west, and the fire a bed of coals as red as the sky. Two months later, I was in Threadmartin's when Bex came in with an evil look on her face. We were taking getting back together slow and easy up till then. The more time we spent around each other, the more we understood that nothing basic had changed. Bex kept coming to the ranch. I took to spending a couple of nights a week in a room her father made up for me at the hotel. Furley Bexter was an old-style McKinnonite. Men and women were, were to live separately and only meet for business and copulation. But he liked me well enough, and when I insisted on paying for my room, he found a loophole somewhere in the, tax of, in the tracks of McKinnon about cohabitation being all right in hotels and hostels. The glims are back, Bex said, sitting down at my table. I was in a dark corner of the pub. I left the fire for those who could not adjust their own internals to keep them warm. They've taken over the top floor of the hotel. What should we do? I took a draw of beer, Fred Martin's own thick porter, and looked at her. She was visibly shivering, probably more from agitation than fright. How many of them are there? I asked. Six. And something else. Some supplies I've never seen, however many that makes. I took another sip of beer. Let it be, I said. They'll get tired and they'll move on. What? Bex's voice was full of astonishment. What are you saying? You don't want a war here, Bex. You have no idea how bad it can get. They killed Rawl. They took our money. Money. My voice sounded many years away, even to me. It's muscle and worry and care. You know how hard people work on Pharaoh. And for those, those things to come and take it, we cannot let them. Bex, I said, I'm not going to do anything. She said nothing. She put a hand on her forehead as if she had a sickening fever, stared at me for a moment, then looked away. One of the glims chose that moment to come into Thread Martin's. It was a Hallandana, a splice, human and Jan, from up time and a couple possible universes over. It was nearly seven feet tall, with a two-foot-long neck, and stooped to enter Thread Martin's entrance. Without stopping, it went to the bar and demanded morphine. Thread Martin was at the bar, he pulled out a dusty rubber, a little used, and before he could get out an injector, the Hallandana reached over, took the entire rubber, put it in the pocket of the long gray coat it wore. Fred Martin started to speak, then shook his head and found a spray shooter. He slapped it on the bar and started to walk away. Hallandana's hand shot out and pushed the old man. Fred Martin stumbled to his knees. I felt the fingers of my hands clawing, clenching. Let them loosen. Let them go. Fred Martin rose slowly to one knee. Bex was up, around the bar, and over to him, steadying his shoulder. Glim watched this for a moment, then took its drug and shooter to a table and got itself ready for an injection. I looked at it closely now. It was female. That did not mean much in Hallandana splices. I could see it phase around the edges with dead gray flames. I clipped in wide band over space and I could see through the Hallandana to the chair it was sitting on and the unpainted wood of the wall behind it. And I saw more in the spaces between spaces. Hallandana was keyed, keyed into a web squad. It wasn't really an individual anymore. Its fate was tied to that of its unit commander. So the war ghosts, the glims, a renegade squad, most likely, a single leader calling the shots. For a moment, the Hallandana glanced in my direction, maybe feeling my gaze somewhere outside of local time, abandoned down to human normal. I quickly went back to what it was doing. Bex made sure Thread Martin was all right, then came back over to my table. We're not even in its timeline, I said. It doesn't think of us as really being alive. Oh, God, Bex said. This is just like before. I got up and walked out was the only solution. Could not say anything to Bex. She would not understand. I understood. Not acting was the rational, the only way, but not my way, not until now. I enhanced my legs and loped along the road to my house. When I got there, I kept running, running off into the red sands of Pharaoh's outback. The night came down, and so the planet, and as the planet turned, 
I ran along the length of the big snake, bright and hard to the southwest, and under the blue glow of Steiner, and she rose in the moonless, trackless night. I ran for miles and miles, as fast as a jaguar, never tiring. How could I tire when parts of me stretched off into dimensions of utter stillness, utter rest? Could Beck see me for what I was? She would not see a man, a kind of colonial creature, a massive life pressed into the niches and fault lines of existence like so much grit and lichen. A human is anchored with only his heart and his mind. Sever those and he floats away. Floats away. What was I? A Medusa fish in an ocean of time. A tight clump of nothing disguised as a man. Something else. Something damn hard to kill, that was certain. And so were the glims. When I returned to my house in the star-bright night, I half expected to find Bex, but she was not there. So I rattled about for a while, powered down for an hour at dawn and rested on a living room chair, dreaming in one part of my mind, completely alert in another. Next day, Bex still did not come. Began to fear something had happened to her. I walked partway into Heidel and cut off the road and stole around the outskirts to a mound of shattered volcanic rocks, tailing of some early prospector's pit not far from the town's edge. There I stepped up my vision and hearing, made a long sweep of the main street. Nothing. Far, far too quiet, even for Heidel. I worked out the parabolic to, to the Bexter Hotel, and after a small adjustment, heard Bex's voice and her father's. I was too far away to make out the words. My quantitatives gave it a positive ID. So Bex was all right, at least for the moment. I made my way back home and put in a good day's work making whiskey. The next morning, it was, the, it was the quarter year's double dawn with both suns rising in the east nearly together. Bex came to me. I brought her inside and in, the, and in the moated light of my family's living room where I now took my rest when I rested, Bex told me that the glimpse had taken her father. He held back some old midnight livet down in the cellar and didn't deliver it when they called for room service. Bex, Bex rubbed, her, rubbed her left fist with her right finger expertly, almost mechanically, as she needed a thousand balls of bread dough. How do they know these things? How do they know, Henry? They can see around things, I said. Some of them can, anyway. So they read our thoughts? What do we have left? No, no. They can't see in there. At least I'm sure they can't see in your old man McKinnon's nut lump of a brain. They probably saw the whiskey down there in the cellar, all right. A door isn't a very solid thing for a war ghost out of its own time and place. Bex gave her hand a final squeeze, spread it out upon her lap. She stared down at the lines of her palm, then looked up at me. If you won't fight, you have to tell me how to fight them. I won't let them kill my father. Maybe they won't. I can't take that chance. Her eyes were blazing green as the suns came full through the window. Her face was bright lit and shadowed as if by the steady coals of a fire. You've loved this woman a long time, I thought. You have to tell her something that will be of use. What could possibly be of use against a creature that had survived, will survive, that great and final war, and so must survive now? You can't kill the future. That's how the old sergeants will explain battle fate to the recruits. If you're meant to be there, they'd say, then nothing can hurt you. And if you're not, then you'll just fade. So you might as well go out fighting. You can only irritate them, I finally said to Bex. There's a way to do it with a flash. Uh, talk to the technician. What's his name? Jarvin Vorak. Tell Vorak to strobe the local interrupt, 50, 60 tetracycles. It'll cut off all traffic, but it will be like a wasp nest to them. They won't want to get close enough to turn it off. Maybe they'll leave. Vorak better stay near the node after that, too. All right, Beck said. Is that all? Yes, I said. I rubbed my temples, felt the vague pain of a headache, which quickly receded as my internals rushed more blood to my scalp. Yes, that's it. Later that day, I heard the crackle of random quantum tunnel spray as split, unsieved particles decided their spin, charm, and color without guidance from the world of gravity and cause. It was an angry buzz, like the hum of an insect caught between screen and window pane, tremendously irritating to listen to for hours on end if you were unlucky enough to be sensitive to the effect. I put up with it, hoping against hope that it would be enough to drive off the glimpse. Bex arrived in the early evening, leading her father, was ragged and half crazed from two days without light or water. The glimpse had locked him in a cleaning closet in the hotel, where he sat cramped and doubled over. After the buzz started, Bex opened the lock and dragged the old man out. It was almost as if the glimpse had forgotten the whole affair. Maybe, I said, we can hope. 
She wanted me to pull the old man up at my house in case the Glim suddenly remembered. Old Shirley Baxter didn't like the idea. He rattled on about something in McKinnon's letter to the Canadians, but I said yes, he could stay. Bex left me with her father in the shrouds of my living room. Sometime that night, the quantum buzz stopped. In the early morning, I saw them, five of them, stalking along the road, kicking before them the cowering, stumbling form of driven Dvorak. I waited for them on the porch. Shirley Baxter was asleep in my parents' bedroom. He was exhausted from his ordeal. I expected him to stay that way for a while. When they came into the yard, Vorak ran to the pump and held, held to the handle as if it were a branch suspending him over a bottomless chasm. And for him, it was. They'd broken his mind and given him a dream of dying, soon to be replaced by reality, I suspected, and no pump handle hope of salvation. Their leader, or the one who did the talking, was human-looking. I'd have to band out to make a full ID. Didn't want to give anything away for the moment. He saved me the trouble by telling me himself. My name's Merrick, he said. Come from a D-line, not far, not far downtown from here. I nodded, squinting into the red brightness reflected off my, off my hard pan yard. We're just here for a good time, Merrick continued. What you want to spoil it for? I didn't say anything for a moment. One of Merrick's gang spat into the dryness of my dirt. Go ahead and have it, I said. All right, Merrick said. He turned to Vorak, then pulled out a weapon. Not really a weapon, though, for it is the tool of behind-the-lines enforcers, prison interrogators, confession extractors. It's called an algorithmic truncheon, a trunch in the parlance. Used at full load, a trunch will stop the myelin sheath from axons and dendrites. It will burn up a man's nerves as if they were fuses. It's a way to kill with horrible pain. Merrick walked over and touched the trunch to the leg of Vorak as if he were lighting a bonfire. The flash technician began to shiver, then to seethe like a teapot coming to boil. Motion traveled up his legs, into his chest, out his arms. His neck began to writhe as if the corded muscles were so many snakes. And Vorak's brain burned, as a teapot will when all the water has run out. There's nothing but flame against hot metal. Then Vorak screamed. He screamed for a long, long time. Then he died, crum crumpled and spent on the ground in front of my home. I don't know you, Merrick said, standing over Vorak's body and looking up at me. I know what you are. I can't get a read on who you are. That worries me, he said. He kicked at one of the flash tech's twisted arms. But now you know me. Get off my land, I said. I looked at him without heat. Maybe I felt nothing inside either. That uncertainty had been my companion for a long time, my grim companion. Merrick studied me for a moment. If I kept his attention, he might not look around me, peer inside the house to find his other fun, Furley Baxter, half dead from Merrick's amusements. Merrick turned to the others. We're going, he said to them. We've done what we came for. They turned around and left by the road on which they'd come, the only road there was. After a while, I took Vorak's body to a low hill and dug him a grave there. I set up, I set up a sandstone marker. Since I knew Dvorak came from Catholic people, I scratched into the stone the sign of the cross. Jesus from the Milky Way, another glim, hard to kill. Took old man Bexter once only a week or so to recover fully. Should have known by knowing Bex that he was made of tougher grit. He began to putter around the house, helping me out where he could, though I ran a tidy one-man operation, and he was more in the way than anything. Bex risked a trip out once a week, once that week. Her father again insisted he was going back into town. Bex told him the Glims were looking for him. So far, she'd managed to convince them that she had no idea where he'd gotten to. I was running low on food and supplies and had to go into town the following first day. I picked up a good backpack load at the mercantile and some chemicals for treating the peat at the druggist and risked a quick looking on Bex. A sign on the desk told all that they, told, told all they could find her at Threadmartin's, taking her lunch should they want her. I walked across the street, set my loan down just inside Threadmartin's door in the cloakroom, then passed through the entrance into the afternoon dank of the pub. I immediately sensed glimpses all around and hunched myself in, both mentally and physically. I saw Bex in her usual corner, walk toward her across the room. As I stepped beside a table in the pub's middle, a glim, it was the Hallandana, stuck, stuck out a long hairy leg. Almost I tripped. In that instant, I almost did the natural thing, cast about for some hold that was not present in the three-dimensional world. But I did not. I caught myself, came to a dead stop, and carefully walked around the glim's outstretched leg. Mind if I sit down, I said as I reached Beck's table. She nodded toward a free chair. 
She was finishing a beer, and an empty glass stood beside it. Thread Martin usually had the tables clear as soon as the last drop left a mug. Bex was drinking fast. Why? Working up her courage, perhaps. I lowered myself into the chair, and for a long time, neither of us said anything to the other. Bex finished her beer. Thread Martin appeared, looking curiously at the two empty mugs. Bex signaled for another. I ordered my own whiskey. How's the ranch? She finally asked me. Her face was flushed and her lips trembled slightly. She was angry, I decided, at me, at the situation. It was understandable, completely understandable. Fine, I said. The ranch is fine. Good. Again, a long silence. Thread Martin returned with our drinks. Beck sighed, and for a moment I thought she would speak, but she did not. Instead, she reached under the table and touched my hand. I opened my palm and she put her hand into mine. I felt the tension in her, the bone work of her hand as she squeezed tight. I felt her fear and worry. I felt her love. And then Merrick came into the pub looking for her. He stalked across the room and stood in front of our table. He looked hard at me, then at Beck's, and he swept an arm across the table and sent Beck's beer and my whiskey flying toward the wall. The beer mug broke. I quickly reached out and caught my tumbler of scotch in midair without spilling a drop. Of course, no ordinary human could have done it. Bex noticed Merrick looking at me strangely and spoke with a loud voice that got his attention. What do you want? Are you looking for me at the hotel? Your sign says you're open, Mark Merrick said in a reasonably, uh, reasonable, ugly voice. I rang for room service, repeatedly. Sorry, Bex said. Just let me settle up and I'll be right there. Be right there now, Merrick said, pushing the table from in front of her. Again, I caught my drink, held it on a knee while I remained sitting. Bex started up from her chair and stood facing Merrick. She looked him in the eyes. I'll be there directly, she said. Without warning, Merrick reached out and grabbed her by the chin. He didn't seem to be pressing hard, but I knew he must have her in a painful grip. He pulled Bex toward him. Still, she stared him in the eyes. Slowly, I rose from my chair, setting my tumbler of whiskey down under the warm seat where I had been. Merrick glanced over at me. Our eyes met. At that close distance, he could plainly see the enhancements under my corneas. I could see his. Let go of her, I said. He did not let go of Bex. Who the hell are you, he asked. That you tell me what to do. I'm just a grunt, same as you, I said. Let go of her. The hound Dana had risen from his chair and was soon standing behind Merrick. It, it, she, growled mean and low. Callback, schematic of how to handle the situation, I got up into the corner of my vision. The hound Dana was a green figure. Merrick was red. Bex was a faded rose. I blinked once to enlarge it. Studied it in a fractional second. Blinked again to close it down. Merrick let go of Bex. She stumbled back, hurt and mad, rubbing her chin. I don't think we've got a grunt here, Merrick said, perhaps to the Hal and Dana or to himself, but looking at me. I think we've got us a genuine sky-falling space marine. The Hal and Dana's growl grew deeper and louder, filling ultra and subsonic frequencies. How many systems did you take out, Skyfaller? Merrick asked. A couple galaxies worth? Hal and Dana made an advance on me, but Merrick put out his hand to stop it. Where do you get off? This ain't nothing but small potatoes next to what you've done. In that moment, I spread out, stretched a bit in ways that Bex could not see, but that Merrick could, to some extent at least. I encompassed him, all of him, did a thorough ID on both him and the Hal and Dana. I ran the data through some trash personnel files tucked into a swirl in end space I never expected to access again. Merrick Lambois, corporal of a backline military police platoon assigned to the local cluster in a couple of possible worlds, deserters all in a couple of others. It was aggression enhanced by trans web-like anti-al coding. The squad's fighting profile was notched to the top level at all times. They were bastards who were now pre-programmed bastards. Merrick was right about them being small potatoes. He and his gang were nothing but mean-ass grunts, small-time goons for some of the non-aligned contingency troops. What the hell, Merrick said. He noticed my an analytics that was too fast for him to get a good glimpse of me. He did understand something in that moment, something it didn't take enhancement to figure out. In that moment, everything was changed. Had I but seen. Had I but seen. You're some bigwig, ain't you, Skyfaller? Somebody that matters to the outcome, Merrick said. This is your actual, and you don't want to fuck yourself up time so you won't fight. He smiled crookedly. Diagonal of teeth, straight and narrow, showed whitely. 
Don't count on it, I said. You won't, he said, this time with more confidence. I don't know what I was worrying about. I can do anything I want here. Well, I said, well, and then I said nothing. Get on over there and round me up some grub, Merrick said to Bex. I'll be waiting for it in room 45, little lady. I'd rather do it, I said. Words were harsh and did not sound like my voice. But they were my words, and after a moment, I remembered the voice. It was mine, far from far, far into the future. Bex gasped at their hardness, but took a step forward, moved to obey. Bex, I said more softly, just get the man some food. I turned to Merrick. If you hurt her, I don't care about anything. Do you understand? Nothing will matter to me. Merrick's smile widened into a grin. He reached over slowly so that I could think about it and patted my cheek. And he deliberately slapped me hard, hard enough to turn my head, hard enough to draw a trickle of blood from my lip. Didn't hurt very much, of course. Of course it didn't hurt. Don't you worry, Sky Fowler, he said. I know exactly where I stand now. He turned and left, and the Hallandana, its drugs unfinished on the table where it had sat, trailed out after him. Bex looked at me. I tried to meet her gaze, but did not. I did not look down, but stared off into Threadmartin's darkness. She reached over and wiped the blood from my chin with her little finger. I guess I'd better go. I did not reply. She shook her head sadly and walked in front of me, kept my eyes fixed, far away from this place, this time. Her passing was a swirl of air, red brown swish of hair, and Bex was gone. Gone. They sucked down my heart in a little black hole. You cannot stab me. Colonel Bone, we've done the prelims on Sector 1168. There are 56 Class 1 civilizations along with 270 rationals in Stage 1 or, uh, one or 2 development. 56, 270. Ah, me. Colonel, sir, we can even, we can, we can evac over half of them within 36 hours local and have to defend them in the transcendent, chaos neutral. Guaranteed 40% casualties for us. Yes, sir. What about the civs at least? We could save a few. They wrote down my brain on a hard knot of space. You cannot turn me. Unacceptable, soldier. Sir, unacceptable. Yes, sir. All dead. All those millions of dead people. But it was the end of time and they had to die so that they, so that we all, all in time, could live. He didn't know those civilian civilizations, those people. It was the end of time. He loved life all the same. He died the same hard way as always, for nothing. It would be for nothing. Outside the wind had kicked up. The sky was red with Pharaoh's dust. And a storm was brewing for the evening. I coated my sclera with a hard and glassy membrane, and unblinking, I stopped home with my supplies through a fierce and growing wind. That night, on the curtains of dust and thin rain, on the heave of the storm, Bex came to my house. Her clothes were torn and her face was bruised. She said nothing as I closed the door behind her, led her into the kitchen, began to treat her wounds. She said nothing as her worried father sat at my kitchen table and watched and wrung his hands, watched because there wasn't anything he could do. Did that man, her father said, the old man's voice broke. Did he? I tried to take the thing, the trunch from him. He left it lying on the table by the door. Bex spoke in a hollow voice. I thought that nobody was going to do anything, not even Henry, so I had to. I had to. Her facial bruise, bruises were superficial. She held her legs stiffly together, clasped her hands to her stomach. There was vomit on her dress. The trunch had some kind of alarm set on it, Bex said, so he caught me. Bex, are you hurting? I said to her. She looked down, then carefully spread her legs. He caught me, and then he used the trunch on me. Not full strength, said he didn't want to do permanent damage. So he wanted to save me for later. The voice sounded far away. She covered her face with her hands. He put it in me, she said. And she breathed deeply, raggedly, made herself look at me. Well, she said. So? I put her into my bed, and he sat in the chair beside it, standing watch for who knew what. He could not defend his daughter, but he must try, as surely as the sun rose, now growing farther apart, or the hard pack of my home world desert. Everything was changed. Bex, I said to her and touched her forehead, touched her fine brown skin. Bex, in the future, we won. I won. My command won it. Really, really big. That's why we're here. 
That's why we're all here. Bex's eyes were closed. I could not tell if she'd already fallen asleep. I hoped she had. I have to take care of some business, and then I'll do it again. I said in a whisper. I'll just have to go back up time and do it again. Between the first and second rising, I reached Heidel, and as Hemingway burned red through the storm's dusty leavings, I stood in the shadows of the entrance foyer of the Bexter Hotel. There I waited. The Hallandana was the first stop. Like me, they never really slept. It came down from its room, looking, no doubt, to go out and get another rubber of its drug. Instead, it found me. I didn't waste time with the creature. With a quick twist in end space, I pulled it down to the present, down to a local concentration of hate and lust and stupidity I could kill with a thrust into its throat. I let it live. I showed it myself. All of me spread out and huge, and I let it fear. Go and get Merrick Lambra, I told it. Tell him Colonel Bones wants to see him. Colonel Henry Bone of the Eighth Sky and Light. Bone, said the Hallandana. I thought I reached out and grabbed the creature's long neck. This was the Hallandana weak point, and this Hallandana had a ceramic implant as protection. I clicked up the power in my forearm a level, crushed the collar as I might a teacup. Hallandana's neck carapaces shattered to platelets and shards outlined in fine cracks under its skin. Don't think, I said. Tell Merrick Lambrot to come into the street and I will let him live. This was untrue, of course, but hope never dies, I'd discovered, even in the hardest of soldiers. Perhaps I'd underestimated Merrick. Sometimes I still wonder. He stumbled out, still partly asleep, onto the street. Last night had evidently been a hard and long one. His eyes were red, no detox nano could fully clean up. His skin was the color of paste. You have something on me, I said. I cannot abide that. Colonel Bone, he began. If I'd have known it was you... Too late for that. It's never too late. That's what you taught us all when you turned that offensive around out on the husk and gave the chaos the what for. I'll just be going. I'll take the gang with me. It's to no purpose our staying now. You knew enough yesterday. Enough to leave. I felt the rage, the old rage that was to be once again. Why did you do that to her? I asked. Why did you? And then I looked into his eyes and saw it there. The quiet desire beaten down by synthesized emotions, now triumphant, sadly triumphant, the desire to finally, finally die. Merrick was not the unthinking brute I'd taken him for after all. Too bad for him. I took a step toward Merrick. His instincts made him reach down, go for the trunch. It was a useless weapon on me. I don't have myelin sheaths on my nerves. I don't have nerves anymore. I have wiring. Merrick realized this so almost instantly. Merrick realized this was so almost instantly. He dropped the trunch, then turned and ran. I caught him. He tried to fight. There was never any question of his beating me. That would be absurd. I'm Colonel Bone of the Sky Falling Eighth. I kill so that there might be life. Nobody beats me. It is my fate and yours too. I caught him by the so shoulder and I looped my other arm around his neck and reined him to me. Not enough to snap anything, just enough to calm him down. He was strong had no finesse. Like I said, glims are hard to kill. They're the same as snails in shells. The trick is to draw them out, way out, which is what I did with Merrick. So I held him physically. I caught hold of him, all of him, over there, in a place I can't tell you about, can't describe. The way you do this is by holding a glim still and causing him great suffering so you can't withdraw into the deep spaces. That's what vampire stakes and rum crosses are all about. Like I told Bex, Glibs are bad ones, all right. Bad, but not the worst. I am the worst. Icicle spike from the eye of a star. I've come to kill you. I sharpened my nails. I plunged them into Merrick's stomach, through the skin, into the twist of his guts. I reached around there and caught hold of something, a piece of intestine. I pulled it out, and I tied it to the porch of the Bexter Hotel. Merrick tried to untie himself and pull away. He was staring at his insides, rolled out, raw and exposed, and thinking... I don't know what. I haven't died. I don't know what it is like to die. He moaned sickly. His hands fumbled uselessly in the grease and phlegm that coated his very own self. There's no undoing the knots I'd tied, no pushing himself back in. I picked him up, and as he whimpered, I walked down the street with him. His guts trailed out behind us like a pink ribbon. After I'd gotten about twenty feet, I figured this was all he had in him. I dropped him into the street. Hemingway was in the northeast and Fitzgerald directly east. 
both shown at different angles on Merrick's crumple and cast crazy, mazy shadows down the length of the street. Colonel Bone, he said. I was tired of his talking. Colonel, I reached into his mouth, past his gnashing teeth, pulled out his tongue. He reached for it as I extracted it, so I handed it to him. Blood and drool flooded from his mouth and colored the red ground even redder about him. Then, one by one, I broke his arms and legs. I broke each of the vertebrae in his backbone, moving up his spinal column with quick pinches. It didn't take long. This is what I did in the world that people can see. The twists of other times and spaces, I did similar things. Horrible, irrevocable things to the man. I killed him. I killed him in such a way that he could never come back to life again. Not in any possible place, not in any possible time. I wiped Merrick Lambra from existence. Thoroughly. And with his death, the other glims died, like lights going out, lights ceasing to exist, bulb, filament, and all, like the quick loss of all sensation after brain is snuffed out. Irrevocably gone from this timeline, and that was what mattered, keeping this possible future uncertain, balanced on the fulcrum of chaos and necessity, keeping it free so I could go back and do my work. I left Merrick lying there in the main street of Heidel. Others could do the mopping up. That wasn't my job. As I left town on the way back to my house and my life there, I saw that I wasn't alone in the dawnlit streets. Some had business out at this hour, and they had watched. Others had heard the commotion and come to windows and porches and see what it was. Now they knew. They knew what I was and what I was to be. I walked alone down the road and found Bex and her father both sound asleep in my room. I stroked her fine hair. She groaned and turned in her sleep. I pulled my covers up to her chin. Forty years old and as beautiful as a child. Safe in my bed. Bex. Bex, I will miss you. Always. Always, Bex. I went to the living room, to the shroud-covered furniture. I sat down in what had been my father's chair. I sipped a cup of my father's best barley malt whiskey. I sat, and as the sons of Pharaoh rose in the hard iron sky, I faded into the distant, dying future.